and our sermon series is on building a Christian foundation. You'll remember that last week we talked about, um, we talked about changing the way we think. And, and you have to change the way you think if you are ever going to change the way you act. Because your actions are an outgrowth of the way you think. And the way you think is an outgrowth of where you base your thinking. You'll remember perhaps last year's outline. If you base all of your thinking from your emotions, you will make emotional decisions based on your feelings, and those will tend to leave you unstable. If you base all of your thinking out of culture, then when culture shifts, your thinking shifts, and that leaves you necessarily unstable. But if you base all of your thinking out of biblical basis, then the Bible never changes and you have a solid foundation on which to stand. So what we are really striving for in this month is we are striving to build within each and every one of us a Christian, a biblical worldview. We want you to have a view of the world around you that is based firmly on the foundation of the Bible. Of scripture, And so that's our starting point for everything. So last week, we gave you a system, we gave you a grid to push decision making through so that you would have a way to think biblically. I tried to give you a system for thinking biblically last week. Now what we need to do is we need to take that system and we need to move it out of the private world of my own thoughts and into the public world. And today what we want to talk about is moving that system of thinking into my professional life. So I need to build a professional foundation. I need to take my faith, my beliefs, my thinking into the professional world, into my workplace. Now, some of you immediately are going, whoa, preacher, time out, hold up, I can't do that. Mm -mm, there's rules and there's laws against that, and there's, I can't do that, pastor. Okay, can I take a time out? Can I, let me take a diversion, a detour from the sermon. This is not what I'm going to preach about, but it is something I need to say. There's no other people group on the planet, no other thought process in this country that they could give those kind of rules to. The Constitution of the United States gives you the right to talk about what you believe in and gives you the right to talk about your God. And we need to stop being apologetic as Christians and start standing up for our right to say what God tells us is true. All right, I ain't going to preach on that. That's just my moment, all right? So y'all got it? Okay, now, I am not suggesting... And I don't want to suggest today that you go to church, you go to work and you say, I'm talking about God and you're going to sit down and listen to it, so get ready because here I come. <laughs> not suggesting that. I don't think that would be effective. I don't think that would be the right way to go about it. So how do you build into your professional culture your faith? Let me suggest to you that in order to change the way you present yourself in a professional culture, we've got to change the way you view the very job you have. We've got to change the way you view the way you handle the job you have. And so today, I want to come at you and I want to shift the way we think about our professional world and shift the way we think about our jobs. You say, well, pastor, you know, the Bible talks about our spiritual lives, not our job lives, our spiritual life, not our work lives, our spiritual lives, not our professional lives. Well, I would suggest to you that you're wrong about that. The Bible speaks about both. And the Bible gives us numerous, numerous examples of how we should handle ourselves in a professional world. Jesus gives us one in Matthew chapter 25. And that's where we're going to jump. You're going to get all kinds of stories today. We'll start with this one. This is a parable that Jesus gives in Matthew 25. Here's the way the parable goes. A master is leaving town for quite a while. And he leaves with his servants all of his goods, all of his possessions. And with one of them, he leaves five talents of possessions. With another, he leaves two talents of possessions. And with another, he leaves one talent of possessions. Now, you, you, you're saying to me, you're saying, Pastor, how am I supposed to relate to this? We don't have masters and servants nowadays. Okay, let, let, me, let me modernize the story, if you'll allow me. Can I tell the story from a Hilsonian viewpoint? All right? All right, so the boss man's leaving town, and he's going on an extended vacation. 
And he needs his company to continue to run. So he takes five divisions and he puts one person in charge of five divisions. He takes two divisions and puts another person in charge of those two divisions. And he takes one division and he puts another person in charge of that one division. He then leaves town. He comes back. And some of you are going, oh, whoa, pastor, wait, time out. This is not fair. This is not fair. You got three people. This should have been divided up evenly. I'm going to call my union rep. Yeah, no, 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 no. This, look, you, you say this is not fair, but listen, he did the right thing. The, the, the master, the boss man, however you want to lay with him, he made the right choice. You say, how do you know he made the right choice? The results tell me he made the right choice. See, when he got back, he, he, he begins to settle up with these guys. He goes to the guy that he, he gave five accounts to, five divisions to. He said, he said how'd it go? The guy said, well, you know what? I've had a good few months since you've been gone, and we have doubled the production in these five. You now have 10 production units out of me. He says, good job. The guy with two comes in, and he meets one and says, how'd it go? The guy says, you know what? It's been a good few months since you've been gone. We have double production. You now have four production units out of here instead of just two. Good job. Then the guy with one shows up. said, how'd it go? Well, you know, I, 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 I knew how rough a boss you were, and I was nervous about that. So I went and I just, I just buried our, our, our whole production unit and got it completely protected. I, it, biblical term, buried it in the ground. You know what the boss man's reaction was? He looked at him and said, you wicked and lazy servant. Can I bring this into a Donald Trump world? You're fired. (laughs) But what did he say to the other two? Read this with me. Here's what he said to the other two. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Folks, I need you to understand, that verse will spell out to you how you need to handle your professional life. That verse right there spells out how you need to handle your professional life. Because your professional life is a process, not an event. And you need to allow your professional life to develop. Now, in order, to, in order for us to understand this, we're going to have to shift the way we think about an awful lot of things. So in order to illustrate this along the way, let me just keep telling you stories. i got two more stories for you. The next one I want to tell you is really mine. I want to tell you about getting my first job. See, when I turned 16, my mom and dad handed me the car that was available at the house and said, you can drive this. It was a 1970 Pontiac Catalina, ugliest green you've ever seen. It was about 93 feet long. It got five gallons to the mile. Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? All right. And and I realized quickly that my mom and dad did not plan to finance my driving habit. And so I had to get a job. And so I was 16 and I started putting out applications for jobs. And I've never had a real job before. So I go out and I start putting out applications. I got one interview. That one interview was at the Pizza Hut with a manager named Terry Brown. Now, to this day, we know Terry Brown, because Terry Brown, after we had moved away, began going to my home church, so he goes to church with my mama every week now. But Terry Brown interviewed me. He said, he said, we don't have anything right now, but if I need you, I'll call you. I went, okay, and I went up and put out more applications. I was sitting at home one Saturday evening, and we always have hamburgers on Saturday, and we'd already grilled the hamburgers. And, and, and so the phone rang, and I went and answered the phone, and it was Terry Brown, Michael. You still want that job? I said, yes, I do. He said, he said, well, when can you be here? I said, tonight? He said, yeah, I need you right now. How quick can you get here? Well, you see, what you don't understand is it snowed that day. So I, I, I stopped and I, I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, this is Terry Brown at Pizza Hut. He's offering me a job, but I got to go now. Let me explain something to you about my dad. My stepdad was in construction in the late 70s, and this was the early 80s. And I don't know how many of you remember this, but if you were in construction in North Carolina in the late 70s, early 80s, you were unemployed. 
And so he had already lost a job and gotten jobs and lost jobs and gotten jobs. He was in this odd place where he really had a long career behind him in construction, lots of experience, but was now, it was difficult to get him employed. And he told me, he made sure I understand that if I could find a job, I better take whatever job I could find. I need, I, I need to shift your thinking for the first time, Americans. And the younger you are, the more you need to listen to what I'm about to say right now. Any work that is honest work is good work. You need to understand that. Let me tell you the other thing about my thinking at that moment. I, I, I realized that what I was looking for, I was looking for a human being that would give me money. I knew that I had to exchange some, kind, some service for that human being to give me money. But I was looking for the privilege of receiving money from another human being in exchange for whatever work I could produce. I understood something that I need you to understand. Second shift in your thinking. You ready? Brace yourself. This is going to be difficult. A job is not a right. It is a privilege. You need to understand that. If you can't shift that thinking in your mind, the rest of this sermon will mean nothing to you. If you think somehow because you're an American, they owe you a job, this sermon won't work for you. In fact, let me be real blunt with you. If you think somehow because you're an American, somebody owes you a paycheck, the Bible won't work for you. Because the Bible says that he who does not work does not eat. You have to understand that. So, oh, God wouldn't say that. Look it up. <laughs> Look it up. You got to shift the way you think. We have become, I'm just going to get ugly. Y'all ready? Preacher going to get ugly. All right, I'm just warning you ahead of time. We have become so high minded and haughty that we believe there's work that's beneath us. I've had people look at me and say, well, I'm not taking that job. I'm worth more than that. Well, if you're unemployed, $7 an hour is $7 an hour more than you're making right now. So right now you're worth nothing. Let's get to $7 an hour. I'm just saying. I, ain't mean, I, I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just saying I need to shift your thinking. Okay? Now, no, no, no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Somebody's mad at me already. Just sit still, because if you get up, everybody will know you're mad. Just stay there. <laughs> it's all good. Now, I, dad, my, my dad looked at me. I said, can I go? Well, he knew he had trained me to drive in snow. He'd already trained me to do that. He looked at me, and he said, he's offering you a job. I said, yes. He said, why are you still here? <laughs> okay, I'll be there in a minute. I show up at the Pizza Hut, right? Their, their dishwasher quit at, seven, at like 5 o'clock, something like that. And it was like 7, 7.30 by the time I got there. And, and, and I walked in, and he said, you're going to be a dishwasher. Okay, I'm going to wash dishes. And so he, he took me back there, and the sink was so full of dishes that the sink was taller than I was. <laughs> and you know those pans they make the pan pizza in? There were three stacks of those things. Two of those stacks were significantly taller than I was. And he said, go to it. And so I started washing dishes. And some of y'all are thinking, I was sitting back going, you believe I'm washing these dishes, man, making me wash them. The man is pushing me down, making me wash these dishes. <laughs> you know what I was back there doing? I was back there going, man, they're going to pay me for this. My mama makes me do this for free. <laughs> I was washing them dishes. You know, they taught me how to do that. I washed dishes for eight hours. <laughs> I got done, and Terry Brown said, you'll be back here tomorrow. I said, yeah, I'll be here tomorrow. What time? He gave me a time. He handed me a schedule. The man gave me a schedule. And I showed up every day that he told me to show up. And I washed dishes, and I never once felt bad about it. Man, you know what? I was going to be rich. He was paying me $3 an hour. Sooner, uh, a few weeks later, Terry Brown comes up and says, Michael, you've been doing a good job back here washing them dishes. Come up here and help. I want to teach you how to cook. So I went up and I learned how to cook. A few weeks after that, he said, Michael, you've been doing a pretty good job cooking them pizzas. Let me show you how to run the register. He showed me how to run the register. 
A few weeks later, he says, Michael, you're doing a good job working with those customers. You get along well with them. You handle people well. Let me teach you how to wait tables. And I learned to wait tables. And one day he came to me and he said, Michael, I got to be gone on Friday. I'm going to leave you in charge. And I became the assistant manager of the Pizza Hut. <laughs> you, you, you see the story, right? You see how that goes? See, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you are faithful in a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Y'all, this is not a new story. Let me tell you the other story I want to tell you. It's about a guy named David. Oh, you don't know him by, by that name. You don't know him without his title. You know him as King David. But you see, when we first meet King David in the book of Samuel, he's not a king. You say, I know. That's right. He's a shepherd. No, I'll take you a step lower. When we first meet David in 1 Samuel, he's an afterthought. He's forgotten. He's not even thought of in a moment when people should have thought of him. See, here's what happened. Samuel, the prophet in Israel, comes to Jesse, David's dad, and says, Jesse, God's told me one of your boys is going to be king. And Jesse goes, that's right. He says, well, you start bringing me the boys. We'll see which one God's chosen. They bring out the oldest, and he's tall, and he's a big strapping boy. And, and, and Samuel thought in his mind, this has got to be the one. No doubt, Jesse thought in his mind, this has got to be the one. And, and, and he walks out, and God says to Samuel, mm -mm. can you imagine being one of these boys? They, they, they parade you in front of Samuel, and he goes, no. Next one, no. The next one, mm. no. The next one, ooh. <laughs> wow, no. Goes through all the boys. And finally, there's no one, but nobody left, and nobody thinks of David. Samuel actually has to look at Jesse and say, you don't have any more boys? God told me he's one of your boys. you got to have another boy somewhere. And, and Jesse goes, oh, yeah, I forgot. David. He's an afterthought. His own daddy has not considered him as someone who could hold a high position. So, well, where is this David? He's out watching the sheep. Why? Because he's the youngest. He's the least important. He'll get the smallest portion of their inheritance. He's at the bottom of the totem pole. He's unexperienced. He's the one that gets the worst of the job, so we sent him out with the sheep. Jesse says, nobody in this house is going to sit down until you get David in front of me. And they walk David in the room, and, Je and Samuel says, that's the one. That's the one. And David is anointed to be the next king. But he's not king. He's still a shepherd. Let me tell you how to handle your career and how to understand your career. You have to start as a shepherd. I don't really care what your career path looks like. I don't really care how you've come through. I don't care who your daddy is. I don't care who your mama is. I don't care what's going on in your life. You have to know what it's like to be a shepherd first. These days when you, learn, when you work as a shepherd are important days. They are days, honestly, the shepherd's job, think for a moment about a shepherd's job. What does a shepherd do? Well, he protects the sheep. So a shepherd, by definition, sits outside in a field with a bunch of sheep. And the deepest, most profound conversation around him sounds like, Mah. <laughs> nothing to do. Some of you have read in the Psalms and you've thought, man, that David was awesome. How in the world did he write all those songs and learn all that music while he was king? Y'all, wake up. He didn't. The reason he learned how to play a guitar was because he was out in a field by himself with sheep. He got tired of hearing, Mah, and he learned to play a guitar. He went out the first time, was bored out of his mind, came back home and looked at his daddy and said, I got to take something out there with me. Daddy wouldn't let him have the smartphone, so he took the guitar. <laughs> and he learned to play that thing. That man was so bored that after about two turns out in the field, he was probably as good as Alan on that guitar because he didn't have anything else to do. 
You think he wrote all those songs when he was busy? No, he wrote them songs while he was sitting out there with the sheep. I mean, he had nothing else to do. Y'all, can I stop? Time, 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 time. Teenagers, I'm going to talk to you about something you've never experienced. Creative boredom. It's a good thing. I know you're thinking, no, boredom, I'm bored. Bored is bad. No, 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 not when you're young. Look, when you're older, bored is broke, so that's not good. But when you're young, <laughs> when you're young, bored is good because it's creative boredom. It's time for you to, I'm not talking about the creative kind that gets you in trouble. Just stop it. I mean creative boredom where you sit down and you've got nothing else to do, so you think thoughts. And you think thoughts that are not pumped into your ears by an iPod or made up by somebody else. That's thinking somebody else's thoughts. Think your own thoughts. Let God get up in your heart. If you'll take those wires out of your ears, you can wire God into your brain and maybe you'll understand some things. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That's all the adults clapping adults. Listen to me. I have watched y'all at the gym and on the subway. Yeah, I know what it means when you put them plugs in your ears. It means leave me alone. No, 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 no. We, we, we all need to experience this. Listen. You say, well, that's a boring job. That's a nothing job. That's a dead-end job. That's a, it's a job. And it's a start. And you've got to be faithful with the small things first. God has called us to be faithful with the small things. And that's what the shepherding period of our lives is really all about. Some of you may be in this shepherding period of your life. And you may be the one washing the dishes mad at God because he hadn't given you a job better than washing them dishes. But I'm here to tell you, that's you being faithful in the small things. And if you'll be faithful with the right attitude in those small things, you're going to move on. You're going to move on. Read this verse with me. It's 1 Samuel 17, 37. 1 Samuel 17, 37. Read this with me. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion... And the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. God, Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You know what's going on here? David has been sent from shepherding to meet with his brothers on the front lines of the war. He gets there and there's this big giant named Goliath. And he's threatening all the armies of Israel. The deal is very simple. The rules of engagement are really very simple. Send out somebody to fight Goliath. If Goliath wins, all of Israel's armies are servants to all of the Philistine armies. If the, if the Israelite wins, then the Philistine armies become the servants of the, of the Israeli army. It's very simple rules. And nobody will fight the giant. David shows up and says, well, why won't anybody fight the giant? Well, if you see him, he's huge. I get him. Can you imagine that? That'd be like me going up to the Redskins going, I'm going to be your quarterback. <laughs> they'd go, no, we got Kirk Cousins. Actually, they'd go, no, we, never mind. We'll use a lineman. You know what I'm saying? I mean, listen, it wouldn't work. I, do not, I can't do that job. But this is, this is how David walks up. He just walks up. I got it. And everybody's going, Really? And Saul says, what makes you think you can kill this giant? And David says this. The same God who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. You realize he never would have learned that had he not been a shepherd? God will move you. If you are faithful as a shepherd, he'll move you to be a warrior. And that's the next step. That's the next step in your professional journey. You go from being a shepherd to being a warrior. And when you're a warrior, you're actually tackling the huge, giant issues. You're making a difference. You're making progress. You're doing good things. People are depending on you. You're doing big things when you're a warrior. But you've got to be faithful in those big things because that's what you're called to when you're a warrior. You have to be faithful with the big things. David had to understand that, that, that once he was a warrior, he could not walk out there and fail. You realize that his, him failing when he went out to Goliath, failure meant that the entire army, all of his brothers, his nation would be a servant of the Philistines. All that weight was on his shoulders. And the only reason he could carry that weight was because he said, you come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. 
And that's where he found the courage for that. I need to speak to the warriors in the room for just a moment. You must, you must, you must be faithful in the big things. People are counting on you. For those of you who have employees, for those of you who run businesses, for those of you who have people under you, listen to me. They are counting on you. They are depending on you. And just as I told the shepherds to be faithful in serving their boss, boss man, listen to me. You must be faithful in taking care of them. Toughest day for me all week long. Tuesday. Tuesday morning. When I drive in here on Sunday, there's a, there's, there's a ton of cars here but I'm not responsible for your car. But when I drive in here on Tuesday morning, every car in that parking lot is somebody that works here. And to some degree, to some level, I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for that livelihood. You say, Pastor, that's an awful heavy weight. I know. And let me tell you something, if you're a boss man or you're a business owner and you don't feel that way, hit your knees and ask God to break your heart because you are haughty. you got to feel that. I'm not going to mess around with you. You say, you ought to be nicer to me. No, we're talking man to man today. you got to feel that way because it's big things and they matter. you got to be faithful in those big things. Look at what David says. Look what the Bible says about David taking on the big things. Read this with me. I'm sorry, not there. Let's go back to 17. Yeah, that's it. Read this with me. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Struck down the Philistine and killed him. David succeeded because God helped him. You can carry this weight. You can handle this. But you got to have God to do it, and you got to have the right perspective to do it. If you are faithful as a shepherd in the small things, and you are faithful as a warrior in the big things, there's something else God wants to do in you. He's taken you from a shepherd. He made you a shepherd, and then he made you a warrior. Now he wants to make you something else. God wants to make you now a grown-up. He wants to grow you up. Folks, listen to me. You cannot become a warrior and not grow up. You cannot become a warrior and not become a grown-up. If you do, you become dangerous. You have to become a grown-up. You have to start to really understand who you are. You have to deal with your own issues inside your own heart. You have to wrestle with you are not, mm, see, I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. You are not all that and a, sli- and a slice of bread. You understand what I'm saying? You have to understand you're only what God has allowed you to be. It's God that's brought you here. And you have to understand, listen carefully, that there's still no job that is beneath you. You say, no, 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 I'm the boss man now. I don't care. If there's a job that you employ somebody to do that you are unwilling to do yourself, you have no right to pay somebody else and demand that they do it. Can't be beneath you. You have to still be a servant. I don't have to be a servant, I'm the boss! Oh, that means you got to be a bigger servant. That means you got to serve because you're willing, not because you must. Because now you must doesn't exist. You don't have to. But if you'll do it because you're willing to, not because you have to, you'll see people's lives change. You have to be faithful in the small things as a shepherd. You have to be faithful in the big things as a warrior. But you have to be faithful in the me things as a grown-up you have to deal with you you have to get down inside of who you are and unpack all of that if you think you're too good to do one job or another you better start unpacking why you feel that way you better start breaking down some of the barriers in your life because they're going to destroy you 
I want you to read a scripture. It's again, it, this one's from, this one is later. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 24. But it's again David. And it's David speaking. And it's David speaking to King Saul. Keep this in mind. It's David, the one anointed to be the next king. Speaking to Saul, the one who is the current king. It's David who the nation would prefer to have as a king. Speaking to Saul, whom the Israelites would like to get rid of. It's David who has the future in his hands and, fall, and, and Saul who is the past. And this is what David has to say to Saul. Read this with me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. David had every right to believe that somehow he should come against Saul and destroy Saul and kill Saul and take over. That's what the nation wanted. He had every right to believe he should do that. God had already anointed him as next king. But he had enough of God in him and understood himself well enough to know my job right now is not to lead. My job right now is to follow him. I need you to hear me. You can never be a great leader until you learn to be a great follower. You can never be a great boss until you learn to be a great employee. You can never be a great assistant manager until you wash the dishes. When we were growing up, we grew up Wesley in our whole lives. But Tina and her family didn't. Tina grew up as a Baptist. And uh, she went to a Baptist church down the road from our church. And um, our youth group was stronger than theirs. And so she and her sister began coming to our youth group for a while. And her mom and dad would visit our church once in a while. One day they decided they would attend our church permanently. Let me tell you what pushed them over the edge. You're thinking, oh, it's a theological thing. It's some big doctrinal theology. Nope, that wasn't it. Oh, it's got to be the preaching. Nope, that wasn't it. It's got to be the music at the church. No, that wasn't it. They came to a fellowship dinner with us one time. And as we were sitting there eating, I didn't notice this, but they looked, Debbie, Tina's mom, looked back into the kitchen. And when she looked back there, she saw Ed Crisco wearing a frilly apron, because that's all they ever have in a church kitchen. Washing dishes. See, you don't realize what I just told you. Ed Crisco was the senior pastor. And he, he had employees there that weren't washing dishes. He had volunteers all over the place that weren't washing. But Ed was in there washing dishes. Tina's mom, who was Korean, looked at her dad and said, Daddy, this our church. And they shifted. Tina's dad today is a Wesleyan pastor. There's a church in Lincoln County that has a pastor today because Ed Crisco did the dishes. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? you you got to get alongside these folks, and there's reason for it. It's right because it's right, but it's also right because it's practical. You know what I used to do once I became the assistant manager of the Pizza Hut? All the dishwashers got hired the same way I did. Somebody quit randomly. We'd call them and say, can you be here in 30 minutes? They'd show up, and there'd be a pile of dishes taller than them. Happened every time. So once the restaurant calmed down and everything was under control, I would quietly, not saying a word, put on an apron and go stand beside him, and we'd finish washing dishes together. Once I did that, can I tell you the practical side of this? That employee always listened to what I had to say. I was too young to know that was a smart thing to do. I just knew my mama would beat me if I didn't. <laughs> but I was bright enough to figure out it worked. It's the right thing because it's the right thing. It's the right thing because God's called you to it. Now, I got a whole mixed group in here. 
Some of y'all are going to leave here and you've got a job. You're still shepherd. You're washing dishes somewhere. You're not happy about it. Some of y'all are saying, I ain't never going to wash dishes because I got me a degree. That degree and $4 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So, no, 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 no. Some of y'all are stuck in the shepherd phase and you're maybe, maybe you're frustrated about it. I'm here to tell you today, stop being frustrated about it. You say, no, 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 I, I'm worth more than that. You, you, you may actually be. I don't know the answer to that. But it doesn't matter what you're worth. Can I ask you a question? Are you worth more than the God of heaven? Can I tell you one more story? Jesus, in one of the last lessons he teaches his disciples, puts on a robe, really just a towel around him, takes a basin of water, and he kneels down on the floor, and he reaches out and he takes the feet of his disciples and he begins to wash them. Friends, this is the lowest job on the totem pole. Not only is this job in that culture done by a slave, it's done by the lowest of the slaves. Don't get pedicure in your mind. That's what you're thinking. <laughs> Erase that from your mind. These are the feet of men who have walked dirt roads all day in sandals. They're filthy. They stink. There's probably sores. There's probably wounds on these feet. And Jesus washes those feet. He does the... Listen, listen, listen. The creator of the feet. Are you following me? Oh my word, I might cry on on stage here. The creator of the feet washes them. First mission trip I ever went on. They sent us to Tijuana, Mexico. And we went went with a group that offered baths to children in villages that had no running water. And as we went in, they said, you're only only here to do one job. You're the entry point for the kids. And when they come in, you wash their feet so that their feet are clean when we get them in the showers. I sat here, and these kids had no shoes. And their home was on a garbage heap. You can imagine what their feet looked like playing all day around a garbage heap with broken glass and metal all over the place. And you would sit and you would gently wash these little bitty feet that were cut, bruised, sometimes bleeding. You would quietly lean over to someone and let them know that you had found bugs. And that would need to be dealt with. And I remember sitting there and realizing that this is what Jesus did. And more than any stage I'd ever stood on or more than any sermon I'd ever given, at this moment I was acting like my Savior. You've got to shift the way you see yourself. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but you are not all that. I don't know what you think you're worth. You're worth worth Jesus giving his life for you. But you're called to be like him. Let your attitude, Paul writes, be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God. Did not consider equality with God something to be demanded. But took on the very nature of a servant. Even to the point of death. And if God can wash the feet of humans. The boss man can wash some dishes. Y'all alright? If God can die for human beings. You can start as a shepherd. If God 
can win the battles for humankind over and over and over again and still care about us. You can be a warrior that is faithful. You carry that into your professional life, and I'll guarantee you two things. Your workplace atmosphere will change, and you will be a positive witness. You won't have to come in demanding the name of Jesus. They will come to you and say, what is up with you? And you can answer by saying, oh, I met this man named Jesus. And he changed the way I see the world. And you can take your faith directly into your workplace. Father, I pray right now. I pray, Father, for those who are in this room who are somehow at the beginning of a career, the beginning of a professional life. Lord, they're shepherds. They're washing dishes. They're they're doing things that seem menial and seem worthless, seem meaningless to them. But they're doing what you've given them to do. Let us do the work you give us and let us do it as if we're working for you, not for mankind. Father, help us as shepherds to be faithful in the small things. Father, I speak to many warriors today. People who tackle and do battle with big issues every day. People who wrestle with major problems and people who carry the weight of many people. I ask, Lord, that you would give us strength. Give us the strength and the courage that you gave David to do the right thing and be faithful in the big things that you've handed us to do. And give us the heart of a God who would make us like him. But, Lord, for all of us, teach us to deal with what's going on inside of us. Shift our hearts and... and, and Make our hearts long after you. Father, the Bible tells us why David worked as a great leader. The Bible tells us that he was a man after your own heart. So Lord, teach us to stop chasing our own things and our own wealth and our own success and our own notoriety. Teach us, Lord, even as warriors, even as leaders, even as shepherds, even as servants, teach us to chase your heart. Make us like you. Show us what we should do. Give us, Lord, the wisdom to fill out the blanks we've left empty. What must I do before work to be prepared? What must I do during work to be your witness? What must I do at home? to be your witness. Answer those questions for us, Lord. And make us people who chase your own heart no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. Dishwashers with joy. Bosses with compassion. Warriors with a heart. Leaders willing to wash dishes. Let us chase you. Let us be like you. And let the world see you in us. It's in your name we pray.